The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. I really, truly don't know what voice I should be using to start today's podcast. I really, truly don't know. Yesterday was a weird one. Guys that I thought would perform admirably did very poorly. Guys that I thought would be okay were outstanding on both sides. Both sides of the matchups, both sides of the squads playing head-to-head. I don't know. Hope you guys have your weeks rumbling along. It was a weird Wednesday, short card, but this was a day where if you were streaming, you probably had a lot of guys going. Busy day, heavy day for the streamers. For everybody else, not so much. The back and forth of your week-long battle continues. This is Thursday's Fantasy NBA Today. I'm Dan Bespris, at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. Big thanks uh, to my guy Joe Garcia of the Two Shots podcast for having me on yesterday. That was a lot of fun. I think that might be airing today, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, you can check that out. We're talking Spurs and the MVP race. It's on that other show. Uh, We had Joe on this podcast to talk Spurs back in late 2018, back when we were going hot and heavy with the guests. Lots of guests. It was a fun time. I'm actually looking forward to getting back to that. Right now, though, we are diving hard into the fantasy playoffs. It's streaming time. It's figure it out time. And uh, away we go. (sighs) Ah. I need a deep breath, man. I need a deep breath. This is a really hard... I'm going to let guys... I'm going to let you behind the, the the curtain here. This is a really difficult time for me to do a podcast every day because my, my mood fluctuates so wildly, whereas during the regular season, I don't care that much about every individual day. I feel pretty... At least emotionally, I feel pretty fine going into those podcasts. I, you know, I got other stuff going on in my life that could impact how I feel, but right now it's all basketball everything that's my mood is is completely related to basketball i was pretty upset and then thomas bryant put up a near 2020 game and it made me happier and uh then who the heck was it someone pooped the bed damian lillard pooped the bed and i was sad well the other way around you get it uh quickly here let's do a recap of wednesday and then get situated for the rest of the week from a streaming perspective wednesday golden state went into memphis and beat them up pretty good uh pretty normal minutes in this one outside of the last two or three maybe i think memphis pulled their guys the last three minutes of this game steph curry didn't shoot the ball well but otherwise had a very nice fantasy game six threes a steal and two blocks kevin durant did shoot the ball well 12 out of 13 career best Boogie had six defensive stats, just reminding us of how high he should be drafted next year. And uh, starting five for the Warriors, easy enough. For the Grizzlies, who are a very popular streaming team this week, Delon Wright had three steals, but otherwise had a very quiet evening with Mike Conley playing. And if Conley's playing in this one, that means he's probably going to play in one of the two back-to-back games. So expect a fine, we'll call it an okay line from Wright in one of the two, and then he'll probably go big in the other one be a pretty safe bet i think bruno caboclo is probably the story from this one 17 13 a steal two blocks and three three pointers that's a couple good ones in a row for bruno the problem is it's too late to stream the grizzlies now they only have two games the rest of the way and do you dare take the chance on bruno that he can do it three times in a row i don't think i would i'd be petrified to roll him out there it and it's not that their schedule is problematic. They've got Phoenix. That's a wonderful opponent to r- trot him out against. And the Clippers, who play a pretty high-tempo game. Uh, I just I don't know if I trust it. It does give you some opportunities, though, if you were trying to make some moves late in the week. He seemingly is a good choice for rebounding and defensive stats right now. And the three ball is falling for him. But I wouldn't expect that to continue forever. The, the regression is going to hit on the field goal percent. He's not going to shoot 50 to 60% long term but all we need is for it to happen for you know a day or two so we shall see he's not at the top of my list but he's certainly on it 
Tyler Dorsey was a popular streaming choice. He had a quiet game, and a lot of it comes down to Conley, whether or not he plays because he is such a high-usage guy when he's on the floor. Jonas Valanciunas is going crazy high usage these these days. He took 25 shots in this game. That's fantastic. He still has two more this week. Uh, Chandler Parsons was okay as well. Again, you know, you're looking for a weekend back-to-back with this team. It's something that you could kind of put on the back burner. Think about it. We haven't heard anything out of Avery Bradley, so I wouldn't change the assessment of any of these guys. Justin Holiday had five steals in this game and three threes. This is like early season Justin Holiday, but again, can you trust that it'll happen again? If you're hunting steals, I don't, I mean, not a terrible pickup for the back to back at the end of the week. Just something to keep in mind. If he's not already owned, I guess that's the other part of it. Some of these guys might already be on some teams. For other stuff, I don't think you're you're venturing into that department. Portland blew out Chicago, and they didn't even need Damian Lillard to do it. It did answer some of the questions on what be what might happen at the center spot. Would Ennis Cantor have finished the ball game if it was closer? I'm inclined to think probably not. He's not a defensive minded guy. He's going to see a lot of his time. Uh, they started him, which actually kind of surprised me. I thought they'd bring him off the bench for that scoring punch. Seth Curry stayed hot. I mean, that's his go-to, man. He's a high-percentage dude who can hit three-pointers. It's pretty good. Um, And then they didn't need Damian Lillard. He went 3-for-12 in this game. They still won by 20 because Zach Collins had 13 with two blocks. Al Farouk Aminu double-doubled. Seth Curry had 20. Rodney Hood had 15. And uh, Cantor had 13 and 6 and went 1-for-4 at the free-throw line in a very weird game. He'll be better than that, presumably, in the next one. Uh, But it's it's tough to say exactly what to expect. I, I think Cantor... I mean, they're going into Atlanta. That's a gold mine for fantasy numbers. And then Detroit is going to be a weird one because he's going to have to deal with Andre Drummond. So I would expect one of the two games the rest of this week to be a pretty good one for Ennis. And then with Zach Collins, you got what you wanted to out of him in this one. 25 minutes, a couple of blocks. That's what you would have added him for, for the three the rest of the week. Shaq Harrison, he's going to be huge as long as Chris Dunn and Zach Levine are out. Uh, don't know if they're coming back this week. I would guess that they're not, which means Shaq Harrison's going to go huge. Wayne Selden has enormous opportunity right now, uh, and Robin Lopez is still playing well. Those are the three guys I think I would use on Chicago if I had the opportunity to just drop a guy into the mix. They obviously have a terrible schedule the rest of the week, so you're not streaming a bull. They have the Raptors on Saturday. Brutal. If you have a bull that's not named Shaq Harrison you probably have to punt them at this point because the schedule is so poor. If you're in a streaming situation, if you're in a standard nine cat, obviously you, you know, you hang out and you take the games where you can and it's it counts towards your limit. Oklahoma city came back and won it late. They trailed in this game in the first half. And then Paul George woke up a little bit. He had 31 and four, only one steal, oddly enough. And the usual suspects did what they normally do for Oklahoma city for Indiana. Uh, Darren Collison made his return, and he was pedestrian. I figure it'll take him a game or two to get his legs back. Uh, Thad Young was okay. Demonis Sabonis was solid. Boyan was good again. And then Miles Turner had his customary four blocks. And Indiana, you know, they're just, they're not a championship-level team without Victor Oladipo. They can be pretty good at times, but not good enough. Washington and Phoenix, this was the highest-scoring fun one we expected it would be. Thomas Bryant, who was a very popular streaming pickup this week after a quiet one in L.A., played the entire second half of this game, 24 consecutive minutes, and he had 18 and 19 with two threes, including, by the way, a game winner, a steal and a block, missed a bunch of free throws, which, like Ennis Cantor, you got to figure that has a blip, and it'll go away in the next one, and... Outside of the free throw thing, you had to feel like a pretty big winner to get Bryant taking 16 shots and nearly going for 20-20. Bradley Beal took 28 shots. Jordan McRae had 21 points and nothing else. Sato, a very low assist game for him, but he got his three steals and good percentages like usual. And then Jabari Parker went nuts off the bench. For Phoenix, it was Devin Booker and versus the world. He had 50 for the second game in a row. 59, I think, in the last one, was it? 51? Doesn't matter. 50-plus for two games in a row. Uh, It doesn't pass much, and I wouldn't if these were the teammates that uh, I had trotting out right now. Although DeAndre Aiden was okay for the minutes he was on the floor. Rashawn Holmes' minutes are trending back up again. He fouled out in 21 minutes, but had 7-4 with two steals and a block. 
Uh, what else we got going on in this game? And I think that's it. Dragon Bender had one good quarter. Mikhail Bridges is slumping from the field, and Phoenix has a terrible schedule the rest of this week, so that's a team that you probably want to avoid unless you were trotting out the big guns. And then finally, you got the last one on the docket, which went about as we expected. Lakers on a fatigue altitude back-to-back in Utah. JaVale McGee continued to impress with his stretch run. He's been very good. Kyle Kuzma was solid. You knew LeBron wasn't playing in this ballgame. Uh, KCP, not surprisingly, cooled off after his big game. Uh, and those are the guys I think you likely trust, even whether sort of regardless of the LeBron situation. Uh, Rudy Gobert, he did enough before the game got out of hand. Joe Ingles, monster game. He's been so good since the All-Star break. He's pushed up his entire season with this stretch run. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal because he wasn't great the first half of the year. We're talking about his weird home road splits. He just looked out of sorts. He's now inside the top 90 for the entire season, uh, and it's been it's been fun to have him over that stretch. It's been a lot better. It's been a lot better. Uh, Jay Crowder was pretty good. He has his ups and downs, obviously, usually at the expense of Derek Favors, but he was actually pretty good too. Not much going on there with Utah, though. They've only got one more game the rest of this week. And if your season happens to continue, they have six down the stretch, but they have just Washington on Friday, and that'll be it. Thursday card is medium size. Again, you sort of fluctuate. Again, it's the, it's the weird back and forth. You know, if you had a bunch of games on Wednesday, you probably don't on Thursday. Flip-flops back and forth this week. Orlando, one of their remaining two games occurring here on Thursday. They are in Detroit who also has two games left on the docket. So if you're sitting on these guys, you're not doing anything crazy. Brooklyn, two games left. Philly, two games left. Uh, You're in a spot now where almost everybody is sitting on two, with a couple exceptions on this card tonight. The Clippers have three games left this week. The Kings and the Nuggets, all three teams on the road. Clippers are in Milwaukee. Kings are in New Orleans. Denver is in Houston. There are not a ton, I would think, of remaining strong streaming options on those particular teams. If they were, they were probably picked up already because the Nuggets have had a pretty good playoff schedule. The Kings have had a very good playoff schedule. And the Clippers have had a pretty good one with one minor lull in the middle. The only name that pops up for me that hasn't been discussed on this podcast ad nauseum is Garrett Temple. And it's a it's a huge roll of the dice because his playing time is contingent on mostly the absence of Clippers' backcourt players of whatever shape or size, Landry Shamit and or Patrick Beverly. If you look at the schedule for the Clippers, and that may be the way we figure this thing out, Clippers have a game in Milwaukee, which you, know, you could trot everybody out there and really go whole hog on it. I would venture to say that they probably hold guys out unless it, unless it's really mission critical. This is one of the games down the stretch for L.A. where they're probably looking at it and thinking, you know, we're probably going to lose this game, and we could go crazy. We're headed home. We got Cleveland. We got Memphis. Very winnable games at the end of the week. You host Houston. That'll be a tough one. Host the Lakers at Golden State. That's a tough one. And then hosting Utah. You can't really take any games for granted, but this is a team now that is in a pretty good spot, at least in terms of, sort of how the the how the west was won so to speak la is on the rise they're in the five seed right now half game up on the jazz a game up on the thunder and winners of six in a row a loss would drop them into a uh statistical tie in the loss column with the thunder that would be loss number 31 they have, by all accounts, about a fairly similar schedule to Oklahoma City down the stretch just in terms of difficulty. They've got a few very winnable games, some that are uh, certainly a bit tougher. I think it balances out a little bit. I think Patrick Beverly plays. He seems like that kind of guy. He always plays through stuff and just is not nearly as effective. I don't know about Landry Shamit. There just isn't enough of a book on him to make the guess, hey, is this guy going to actually give it a go or are they going to hold him out and, and kind of see what happens? I think Landry Shamit probably sits. I think Patrick Beverly probably plays, and so you probably get mid-20s minutes out of Garrett Temple. He got up into the 30s in that last one, and he put up a really nice fantasy line. 20-some-odd minutes wouldn't really be enough, but three games of that 
is somewhere between 60 and 70 minutes, and that's pretty good. That's like a little over two full games for most NBA starters, and he's shown a propensity to get the steal and the three ball on okay percentages, and so there's your ticket there. You got three games, and you just have to hope that one of the three hits big and the other two are not too awful. If that pans out, great. Uh, Most of the guys with the team like the Kings, they're basically accounted for uh, who else is floating around out there? The, the, let's see, Bielitsa, he's probably already been picked up. The rest of the Kings starters, they're already on your team. Marvin Bagley is probably on a team. And the other one is the Nuggets. And with the Nuggets, I'm just trusting the starting five now, so I don't. I wouldn't recommend a Malik Beasley stream or a Monty Morris stream, and I think Beasley's out with a personal thing anyway. Uh, Mason Plumley, maybe? If you need big man stats, that's the only way I would consider rolling with that one. So the three gamers the rest of the way are are a tough lot to pick from and so when I think about it from that perspective I'm probably not making any moves to these remaining three games it's why I I stressed on yesterday's podcast hey take a pick from one of these teams that still has three games because by tomorrow which is now today the pickings gets a little slim slim pickings if you wait and you just go with the guys who have two games left, you have a boatload of options. There are going to be a bunch of guys on your wire that you could pick up and roll with. And we will talk about that right now. Because everybody else has two. And when we look towards these games, these this Thursday evening card, Orlando, Detroit, nothing jumps out. Is all that intriguing. Uh, Detroit, you got some three-point shooters if you need them. Brooklyn, uh, Ed Davis, maybe, if you need some rebounds. Might be a guy to grab for two games. Philly, nah. Dallas, mm, I'm guessing Kleba, Powell, guys like that are probably owned already. Miami, you could probably stream Dion Waiters if you need points and threes. I wouldn't trust too many of the other fringe guys. You got the Dwayne Wade farewell tour. That's still a thing. All right, you could throw him into the mix so there's some options here on Miami but you're probably looking at stats now you're looking at category hunting so really just hone in on guys that can do one or two things well the Knicks I don't think I'd trust too many guys on that team guys like Dotson could score you some points Moutier maybe Toronto nobody Clippers we just talked about them they've got the three games left Milwaukee Pat Connaughton is an interesting stream if you need some defensive stats He's a choice. Uh, Sacramento, nothing really there. New Orleans, you got some choices because their whole backcourt is is done now. Frank Jackson has a concussion. You could go a lot of directions. I think Kenny Hustle actually is a really good two-game stream. Houston, uh, Daniel House, if you need threes. Cleveland, not much. And then San Antonio, most of the guys there I think that are relevant are picked up. Uh, and if you want three-pointers, I think I'd go to a different team anyway. And so that, I think, is where the, the choices now come into play. The, the three versus two is a decision that usually leans towards the guys with three games. There are just so few options right now in that grouping that I have trouble suggesting it. Even, you know, Garrett Temple, like I said, and, and he needs somebody to be out for it to make sense. Otherwise, and you, maybe you're in a league where there are more guys available as streaming options on those three three game teams. And if that's the case, uh, again, looking at it like Bielitsa, he's a worthwhile three game streamer. That's better than a lot of the two game guys. Uh, Gilgis Alexander, if he's available in your league for the Clippers is a worthwhile choice. Uh, someone at the end of, of the five nuggets starters, like if Gary Harris happens to not be owned in your league, he would be a worthwhile stream, but I'm guessing those guys are owned. I can't be positive, but I have to assume based on ownership level that for the leagues that we're talking about right now, those guys are probably on teams, but maybe they're not. And if that's the case, then you can go seek them out. Because to me, those guys are worth it. The three games versus the two. If you're talking about, oh, geez, what, I mean, what are some of the other names on these teams? Like Jamichael Green for the Clippers, even three games for him is like 45 minutes. And you can find plenty of dudes that can eclipse that number in two minutes. That's the minute count. That's what it's really going to come down to here, the minute count. If you can get a guy who's playing 24 minutes or more, 
in three games, 72 minutes, that's probably going to be pretty good. Because most guys you pick up that are that with two games are probably aren't going 36 minutes in each of them. Very few guys do. But less than that, and just uninteresting guys, uh, I you know, I love the three game stuff, but it's just not it's just not worth it. And as I've been saying all week, if you have questions about this stuff, please do hit me up on Twitter. I'm more than happy to answer these questions because I'm bandying these IDs around in my head all day. I'm setting alarms on my phone to make sure that I don't miss start times for particular games so that I can get the guys that I need to. It's mission critical stuff. I mean, this is not, there's no time to be screwing around. No messing, guys. No messing around. At Dan Bespris on Twitter. Oh, big thanks again to Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company at H.I. Kona Coffee on Twitter. HawaiianIsles.com is the website. HawaiianISLES.com or search for them on Amazon. Get that good stuff sent right to your doorstep. Amazon Prime style. Prime style. A few more thoughts on streaming. As you look towards the weekend, and this is how I always wanted to do it, but oftentimes it, you know, the world doesn't let us make the decisions this easily. I would love to still have two moves come Friday. One of the reasons that I don't generally hold multiple moves for the very last day is that I usually, and I think you guys will feel the same way, if you're doing the the lifting here, usually you'll have a pretty good idea what categories you need to attack by Friday or Thursday. And it's important to figure that out a couple days in advance. And obviously, crazy things can happen. You could have a guy that blows up that doesn't normally do that. You know, you could have a guy that averages eight rebounds a game that gets 22 some night. Like, weird things do take shape that can kind of throw your strategy for a loop. But, for instance, one of the reasons to pick up Thomas Bryant is if you think you're going to be attacking rebounds and he appears to be the full-time starter now. He's playing huge minutes, and you could get four games out of the dude. Why wait until later in the week to figure that out? Why wait? So I think if you still got two moves in your in your chamber, in your quiver on Friday, you should use them, at least one of them on Friday. You can save one for the last day if you want, if somebody gets hurt. But at that point, it's like, pff, I mean, should have moved used the move earlier to maximize games, and then it wouldn't matter. You know, break even at that point. So go drop someone who only has one game Friday through Sunday for somebody that has two. You know what you're going to need at that point. Start making the moves. I went a little bit early on mine, frankly, earlier than I wanted to, but Jeremy Lamb's injury forced my hand. I also put together, and I mentioned it briefly on yesterday's podcast with Micah Patria, I put together a playoff matchup tabulator Excel spreadsheet. I filled in the numbers late this afternoon, or uh, when did I put that? It was like right at the start of games yesterday, and uh, showed me that I actually had an edge in rebounding, and I, I had a better shot to attack that category than I realized. This is why it's important not only to see the games that each team has, remaining you know like your opponent has 38 you have 35 but what positions are those games are at what positions are dominant in those my opponent is guard dominant with his remaining games whereas i sort of had a choice if i make my move early i could i could swing it in a different direction and we'll see if that pans out i I mean you got to pull out all the stops here by all accounts, I should probably lose this week because of all the guys I keep dropping. Uh, Zach Levine, Jeremy Lamb, two of my good players are down. My opponent has zero injuries. And Ennis Cantor, who probably is going to get a boost as the weekend goes on. And then I just have to hope for the best. You make the moves. You do the math. If you outwork your opponent, it does give you a better chance. It doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but it certainly ups the probability. If you'd like, and I might try to put a little screenshot on Twitter so you guys can see what I'm talking about here, my little playoff matchup tabulator. I might find a way to throw this thing uh, up on the net if you guys want to take your own guys and plug them in. You do have to do some data entry, which is a little bit of a pain, but I've I've set up the summing and uh, the the multiplying and the the additional summing 
that is required to figure out basically what you have left. And then you'll have to take the numbers from the sheet and add them to your specific matchup. So there's going to be some work involved on your end, but I've done the, the Excel lifting portion. And if you take, I don't know, probably about a half an hour, you can get all your numbers inputted. Just set the Excel spreadsheet up side by side with your team page. Pull up, you know, I, I, th- I would recommend averages of the last two to three weeks. Yahoo gives you the last two weeks if you want. You can make adjustments to try to get it as accurate as possible for particular guys and what they've been doing lately. And then you can see where you might have an edge. Does your opponent have a ton of guards playing? If so, maybe it would behoove you to just give up on a particular guard stat. Don't even try to beat them. Insist. Switch your strategy. I'm doing a little bit of that myself. So I'll throw a screenshot up. If you guys like it, maybe I can put this Excel thing... uh, somewhere on the internet, just a file that you can download and use it yourself. It's really not a ton of work, and I might use it next year again. Too much work for the regular season, but certainly worth it for the playoffs. This was your Half Size Thursday edition of Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Baspris. Coming up tomorrow, recorded show with the great Aaron Bruski. Uh, and then next week, the last full week of the NBA regular season, when most head-to-head leagues are done, but Roto Leagues are wrapping up. Brew and I will have our last live show I'm guessing there won't be a ton of questions, but we'll have a little bit of fun with it, Uh, get a little weird, and uh, do some wrap-up stuff. Can't believe we're that close to the end. Holy hell. Uh, So again, tomorrow is recorded. Don't set your clocks. We'll just get that show out when it's done, and then we'll roll on through the weekend, and hopefully everybody will survive until Monday. Uh, I guess that doesn't make any sense. Hopefully your leagues end with victory. We can celebrate together on Monday or cry together. Either way, we'll do something together. Thanks for listening, everybody. Again, this is Thursday's Half Sizer of Fantasy NBA Today. Back with Brew tomorrow. I am Dan Vespers at Dan Vespers on Twitter. Uh, give me a follow so that you can see when I post this thing. See if you like it. B E S B R I S. You know the name. Uh, again, if you're a coder out there and you'd like to do a little work over here at Hoopball, we're looking for some young neophyte programming types to get into the mix. Hit me up for that as well. So long, everybody. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.